Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman and Daniela. We return to Winnicott and explore ego distortion in terms of true and false self. An integrative paper that came late in Winnicott's life. He was in his mid 60s when this came out. And he asked certain questions such as how does the false self arise? What is its function? Why is the false self exaggerated or emphasized in some cases? Why do some not develop a false self system? What are the equivalents of the false self in normal people? And what is there that could be named a true self? The experience of the false self. A middle-aged woman who had a very successful false self, who had the feeling all her life that she had not started to exist and that she had always been looking for a means to get to her true self. I found I was dealing with what the patient called her caretaker self. Gradually, after three years or more, handed over its functions to the analyst. Hovered around, resuming caretaking when the analyst failed. Analyst illness or holidays. She contains no true experience. This is the same patient. She has no past. She starts with 50 years of wasted life. But at last she feels real and therefore she now wants to live. So the false self begins to fail. The false self sets up as real. And it is this that observers tend to think is the real person. In living relationships, work relationships and friendships, however, the false self begins to fail. In situations in which what is expected is a whole person, the false self has some essential lacking. At this extreme, the true self is hidden and the false self defends the true self. The true self is allowed a secret life. The main concern of the false self, a search for conditions which make it possible for the true self to come into its own. Instead of cultural pursuits, one observes in such persons extreme restlessness, an inability to concentrate and a need to collect impingements from external reality so that the living time of the individual can be filled by reactions to these impingements. Reactions to these impingements. Under extreme failure enters this desperate response to the situation, which is suicide. Suicide in this context is the destruction of the total self in avoidance of annihilation of the true self. When suicide is the only defense left against betrayal of the true self, then it becomes the lot of the false self to organize the suicide. This, of course, involves its own destruction, but at the same time eliminates the need for its continued existence, since its function is the protection of the true self from insult. This topic, it really uh, demands further exploration that are beyond 
beyond the scope of the pres current presentation. Normal functioning of the false self in healthy, in the healthy, we see the polite mannered social attitude, not burdening people with their emotions too much, not wearing the heart on your sleeve, showing the ability to compromise, to forego omnipotence. And the gain is the place in society which can never be attained or maintained by the true self alone. So we look now at development and the role of the good enough ordinary devoted mother. The good enough mother meets the omnipotence of the infant and to some extent makes sense of it. She does this repeatedly. A true self begins to have life through the strength given to the infant's weak ego by the mother's implementation of the infant's expressions. And this in the literature is really referred to this mirroring process where the child is able to see themselves in the face of the mother and the mother's mirroring the joy and the frustration, disappointments of the child on her face. This essential maternal function enables the mother to know about her infant's earliest expectations and needs and makes her personally satisfied insofar as the infant is at ease so that the infant starts by existing and not by reacting. The infant starts by existing and not by reacting. The compliant false self emerging, emerging through the reacting to the field. And the mind and the false self, when the false self gets organized in an, individu in an individual who has a high intellectual potential, there is a very strong tendency for the mind to become the location of the false self. And in this case, there develops a dissociation between intellectual activity and psychosomatic experience. If you want to explore this topic a little more fully, we have a separate presentation on the mind in the Winnicott playlist where we discuss this split more fully. So it is in the attachment where we find the roots of the false self. The mother who is not good enough is not able to implement the infant's omnipotence. And so she repeatedly fails to meet the infant's gesture. Instead, she substitutes her own gesture, which is to be given sense by the compliance of the infant. This compliance on the part of the infant is the earliest stage of the false self and belongs to the mother's inability to sense her infant's needs. A defense against that which is unthinkable, the exploitation of the true self, which would result in its annihilation. In such cases, the mother was not only not good enough, but was good and bad in a tantalizingly irregular manner, a teasing manner, an exploitive manner. True self-emergence, the infant begins to believe an external reality which appears and behaves as by magic because the mother's relatively successful adaptation to the infant's gestures and needs, and which acts in a way that does not clash with the infant's omnipotence. The true self has a spontaneity 
and this has been joined up with the world's events, the infant can now begin to enjoy the illusion of omnipotent, creating and controlling, and then can gradually come to recognize the illusory element, the fact of playing and imagination. The true self quickly develops complexity and relates to external reality by natural processes. And Winnicott refers here to the spontaneous gesture. And when the mother cannot adapt, the infant gets seduced into compliance. And a compliant false self reacts to the environmental demands and the infant seems to accept them. Through the false self, the infant builds up a false set of relationships and by means of introjection, even attains a show of being real so that the child may grow to be just like mother, nurse, aunt, brother, or whoever at the time dominates the scene. The false self has one positive and very important function to hide the true self, which it does by compliance with environmental demands. Hide the true self by compliance with environmental demands. The normal equivalent of the false self, well, there's a compliant aspect of the true self in normal living an ability of the infant to comply but not be exposed. The ability to compromise is an achievement. At the same time in health, the compromises ceases to become allowable when the issues become crucial. When this happens, the true self is able to override the compliant self. Clinically, this constitutes a recurring problem in adolescence. Being real, being true to yourself is such a driving force in this age. So the implications for treatment. In the beginning, the therapist can only talk to the patient's true self through the false self, the false self. At the point of transition, when the therapist begins to get into contact with the true self, there must be an experience of extreme dependence. So the therapy, the transference field gives way towards dependency. Often this is missed. The patient has an illness or in some other way gives the therapist a chance to take over the nurse made functions of the false self. The therapist must be prepared to handle the weight that develops in the transference or choose cases that do not include false self types. Three times throughout this paper, Winnicott reports that these are not good cases to learn on. They're not good training cases because of the weight of the transference when the extreme dependency shows up. In closing, the therapist must recognize this part of the patient, the part that's empty, the patient's non-existence. When I said that I recognized his non-existence, he felt that he had been communicated with for the first time. Another patient, the only time I felt hope was when you told me that you could see no hope. And you continued with the analysis. Recognizing, 
putting words on the non-existent, on the void. Thank you for joining us today for Psychological Explorations. Please join us in the future for future podcasts. Bye-bye for now.